From the Oklahoma Newsroom, you're watching Football Friday. I'm Jenny Carlson here with our college football coverage team in the studio with Barry Trammell, columnist, Kyle Fredrickson, OSU beat writer, and joining us remotely from somewhere in Norman, I'm guessing. Norman. Norman. Yes, I am in Norman. Brooke Pryor, our OU football writer. Guys, uh, we've got kind of a split week with OSU on the road at Baylor, OU off this week. So let's start with the team playing this week, and that being OSU. Um, Kyle, this is a full circle game, if you will, for Mason Rudolph. Made his first career start as a Cowboy under sort of duress, if you will, two years ago after the injury to Dax Garman forced Mike Gundy's hand to, to bring Mason Rudolph out of red shirt late. Um, it, it hasn't been to Baylor since, hasn't beaten Baylor in his career. Uh, what, uh, what did we learn in uh, these first three games as it portends to Mason Rudolph heading back to Waco attempting to get that first win against the Bears? Well, I think he's not as sharp as we've seen him in his career, uh, especially in that 10-game winning streak last season. Right before up to that Baylor game, I mean, that TCU victory was huge for this program. Uh, you know, and getting 10 straight, going to Ames, and then beating Iowa State on the road. Uh, so we haven't seen the same guy, but it's certainly been uh, fun to kind of watch this guy grow over the last two years. You know, Barry and I were in Waco for that first game. It was in the rain. Uh, we No one really knew what the quarterback situation was going to be. I thought Barry articulated uh, in his column before the game a good argument that Taylor Cornelius could have been the guy to start, and, and no one could really say anything else about it. Uh, but it was clearly a, a turning point in the program, the way Mason Rudolph was really able to go throw for throw with Bryce Petty in the rain, uh, behind an offensive line, kind of showcased his ability to evade the rush a lot better than Dax Garman did uh, with the number of times he got sacked. So uh, these first three games, I think, for Rudolph have been up and down. You know, I say down. He, the guy set the single-game passing record last week, right. uh, but he did it with just deep ball after deep ball against a pit secondary that seemed to be pretty content with letting James Washington run behind him all day. So. So uh, this is really going to be the first test for him and, and the rest of this offense to see what they might do in conference play. Who are we going to see on Saturday night, Barry? Is it the Mason Rudolph that threw for 540 yards against Pitt, or is it the Mason Rudolph that really struggled throughout the day against Central Michigan? Well, it's a great question. You know, I thought Mason, uh, nothing against him, but I thought Saturday his receivers were fantastic. Yeah. Uh, a couple of those, a uh, couple of those deep balls to James Washington, deep balls to James, Wa James Washington were perfectly thrown. But perfectly thrown means he didn't catch him here. He caught him out here on his fingertips. That's not easy to do. Uh, his receivers really picked him up. But guess what? That's what they ought to do. They're, it's a great receiving core. We say they're great. Play great. So, um, you know, if, if the Washington and Rudolph connection can do what it did last time in Waco, this OSU team is so much better than it was two years ago that I think the Cowboys have a good chance to win. Now, if Rudolph doesn't play that well, if he plays like he did against the Chippewas, then it's going to be hard for the Cowboys to win. We know, Kyle, Mike Gundy said after that game against Pitt that Mason Rudolph, he thought, was really kind of pressing those first two games. Now, granted, Southeastern Louisiana, more practice than an actual game. Mason Rudolph didn't play very much, but, you know, we even saw some some moments that weren't great against, against Southeastern Louisiana, but that they really said to him, you know, don't worry about it. You know, we're going to go out, this is going to be fine. And he seemed to really respond to that because, you know, like Barry said, maybe every throw wasn't, you know, into your body, but he put the ball where he needed to a vast majority of the time. Do you sense him sort of, you've talked to him several times, do you sense him sort of maybe, you know, sort of exhaling a little bit and, and allowing himself to be, to just be who he is? I think so. And, you know, I think if you put anyone in his situation, it's understandable to see why they might be pressing. Here's a guy who had a freshman year, but it was only two games. Yeah. He had a full, his, you know, last year was his first full season. Now he's a junior. This is when elite quarterbacks usually go to the NFL. This is when they make the jump. If you're good enough to play at that level, you know, teams want to take you now. And Rudolph is a guy who wants to play in the NFL. I, I think he's been pretty clear about that. Mike Gundy's talked about it recently uh, with some of the projections. You know, is he a first or second round guy? You let that get into your head you know that's a that's kind of a tough thing to overcome when you're facing you know difficult defenses week to week so uh, the strides against uh, Pittsburgh in this last game uh, but I'd like to see how he performs you know in prime time against a, a team he's never beat uh, you know the, the stakes are much more high let's see how he plays in that type of game because if he's going to want to be an NFL quarterback those are the times he's gonna have to perform last thing before we move to OU for a minute uh, you mentioned earlier the rain a couple years ago well there's some rain in the forecast again. We're supposed Fun. to get it here. It's supposed to be happening in, in, in Texas as well. Um, does that mean, Barry, do you think that 
we'll see more of a run game. We saw Rennie Childs have that 100-yard game last week. Four touchdowns. Hadn't seen numbers like that for a Cowboy running back in quite some time. Do we see run game sort of come to the front, or do they just have to say to heck with it and throw the ball? Well, I mean, I don't know what there is to worry about that Cowboy running game. You know, it's off and going. You, you know, you can't <laughs> stop it. Uh, you can only hope to contain it. But uh, I don't think it'll change the game plan much because Cowboys, this OSU team, as well as it, Rennie Childs performed in the line, opened holes for him. Let's not pretend that they're, you know, this is not the uh, vintage OSU running game. Right. So for this team to move, even if it's rainy, even if it's slippery, Rudolph's going to have to throw to Washington and McCleskey and Seals and all those guys. And they can do it in the rain. We saw them do it when they really didn't even know what they were doing. Yeah. So they do know what they're doing now. I don't think the, uh, the conditions will change the game plan. I do think, though, that Baylor's defensive game plan is going to uh, sort of get a wake-up call because look at the two things that happened against Pitt. The running game blossomed, and the deep ball was incredibly efficient. And now, all of a sudden, Baylor's got a game plan for that, and you've still got the rest of the OSU offense right. that is very effective most of the time. So I think as much as you go into a game with Baylor scared to death about what Baylor can do on offense, mm -hmm. I think Baylor's got to feel the same way going into this game. Yeah, and we'll talk about that Baylor offense in a second. But, Kyle, I mean, I think that Barry brings up a good point. We we really the, – the games we've seen that middle, uh, you know, sort of those those mid-level throws, we've seen a guy like Jalen McCleskey have double-digit catches. So it's not as if they can't do that intermediate passing game. They've sort of shown all of it, maybe not in the same game, but they've shown the ability to do that. Does that mean, you know, regardless of weather, we, we, as you mentioned two, two years ago, they, they played in the rain. Does that mean it doesn't, it doesn't matter what the conditions are on Saturday night? Yeah, I think, you know, rain's one thing, wind is another, lightning is a third thing that we just crossed our fingers won't happen. <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, Mason Rudolph, it's, it's funny, his, his games in the rain are, seem to always be notable. There's Baylor in 2014, and he won a state championship out of South Carolina. It was a rain game. I remember talking to Mike Yersich about that and the comparison. So, it's not that he's uncomfortable with it, but we've also seen him fumble. We've seen him have a bit of a loose grip on the ball. Yeah. You know, the, the weather conditions affect that. Uh, but, you know, regardless of what happens, OSU is going to have to be a team that sets up the run with its pass uh, and hope they get some big plays in open space from guys like Rennie Childs and Barry J. Sanders. That's going to have to be their bread and butter. They just don't have the personnel, I think, to do it any differently. So stick to your game plan. Don't worry so much about the outside noise and the weather and all that. Uh, and just this is sort of an identity game for them. You know, who is OSU? I think we're going to get a lot closer to finding out this week. And near as we know, no Chris Carson not coming back from yeah, that looks, injury just Yeah, it looks like yet. that hand injury is probably going to be multi-week. Okay, all right. We'll, we'll stay, keep posted on that. But let's turn to OU for just a second. As I mentioned before, this is a bye week and off week for the Sooners. Uh, the plan early in the week was uh, three practices this week and then a, a quiet weekend. So the Sooners have finished up their practice for the week, started to turn their attention towards next, week, next week's opponent, that being TCU. But Brooke Pryor, let's bring you into this conversation. This off week, obviously Sooners coming into it one and two, unexpectedly so from their vantage point. What was the biggest thing that these guys really needed to focus on and try to fix in this off week, is it? Uh, did they do they have a leadership issue? I mean, obviously we know the defensive backs. Uh, that's a real concern. Run defense. I mean, the list is fairly long. But what stands at the top of your list? I think the thing that stands at the top of my list is getting that leadership together. Um, we've talked about that a lot this week. We've talked about it in past weeks. That there just doesn't seem to be. A, I don't know if it's a gelling or there aren't there isn't a guy on the defensive side that everybody really points to as hey this is a leader. Um, Jordan Evans is a guy that they've brought in for media availability um, the last couple times when we haven't been able to request those guys. Um, and he's a team captain, so he seems like he's one of the guys that's going to kind of step up. But on the offensive side, you can clearly point to Baker, kind of Samaj P. Ryan. Um, it just seems like there's a lot more vocal people on the offensive side. Defensive side's a lot quieter than it was last year. We've talked about that a lot. No Eric Stryker, no Zach Sanchez, um, no Tapper. So I think that's a big thing. I think they also really need to work on the DBs and getting that cornerback position uh, spot settled. Um, you know, as much as we bring it up, Mike Stoops has been kind of deflecting that. Like, no, it's not that. It, that's a part of it. But we also have, you know, these five things to work on, too. But I think that's the biggest problem is there's just a question mark on that spot. And until that's settled, 
they're not going to be able to get a cohesive defensive unit out there. Barry, on an off week, what can a team realistically work on? I, I mean, you've got you're only going to practice a few times, but what can they realistically maybe take some steps towards fixing in an off week like this? Well, I mean, to me, it's it's a week of practice without the pressure of game planning. So Baker Mayfield can work on quick decision making, which has been a problem for him this season so far. Um, you can take those three corners or whoever else, you know, casting call for the student body. Anybody you want to put at <laughs> cornerback, you can drill them, drill them, drill them on the fade and, and, sh and say, here, whoever plays this best is going to be our corner. And, um, you know, I, I think that these Sooners do miss uh, those, uh, those vocal leaders. Yeah. But when it comes to Zach Sanchez, they don't miss his voice as much as they miss his hands and his feet. Right. Uh, you know, you need guys that can play. And you know, OU's got some guys that just aren't very good in critical spots. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can find a corner. You know, we haven't seen Dakota, Dakota Austin really since Houston uh, early in that game. Um, and maybe, played well last year. Maybe he gets another chance at it. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. you know, and the other problems, whatever they may be, uh, you know, you just work on them. Here's the calling card of Bob Stoops' teams. They almost always get better, markedly better right. during the season. So as much as everybody wants to write off this team because the national title hopes are out, that doesn't mean this team can't get a lot better. Uh, we'll see if it does. Yeah, definitely. Uh, quite a lot of question marks yet to be determined. And well, as I mentioned, TCU next week will test a lot of those areas. But one thing that uh, hasn't been a problem is production out of Joe Mixon and Barry uh, you know, Samaj P. Ryan continues to start, continues to get carries, but from the looks of things, the production that they can get out of Joe Mixon, they can't get out of anybody else. Has he emerged as the go-to tailback, even though he may not be the starter? You know, I, I don't think so for this reason. I think Joe Mixon has emerged as the home run hitter. Okay. I mean, you look, the, the, the three big plays, he had the two against Houston, he had the 97-yard uh, the kickoff return against uh, Ohio State. He's the guy that can go to the, go to the house quick. Right. But P. Ryan has showed us too much over the years to think that he's, he's lost a step. Now, if he's not healthy, that's different. But P. Ryan is the kind of guy that, you know, down after down after down wears you out. I think Lincoln Riley's done a disservice. We talk about the disservice to Joe Mixon not giving him enough touches, but to me there's been a problem with the entire running game not being committed to. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that it helped Mixon. I also think it'll help Samaji P. Ryan because we know what kind of player Samaji P. Ryan is. Yeah, is that, the, is that the case, Brooke, in your mind, that it's just not enough uh, commitment to the run game that neither of these guys, I mean, we, we, we've talked to Bob Stoops about Joe Mixon getting more carries, but is this an issue of both need to get more carries? Yeah, I absolutely think so. I think when you have Baker Mayfield talking about not being able to trust his receivers or, or needing to work on trusting your receivers because he's not comfortable with them yet, et cetera, et cetera, why would you not go to your run game more? Those are two sure thing options both times. You have a good line. Um, there's some injuries there, but Alvarez is a great center or left guard or wherever they choose to play him. Um, it is one of those situations. Why, why would you not continue to hand that off? Um, you know, P. Ryan, like, like we've talked about, is a really good back, and he has shown flashes where he can get, you know, 400 yards in a game. But you have to give him that opportunity, get him the ball. Um, same thing with Mixon. He does make really big, flashy plays. Why would you not go to that option more often rather than have Baker, you know, step back, try to make those throws, get intercepted, or hold on to the ball too long? Just get it out of his hands and see what you can do when you finally get that run game going a little bit. You know, you think about these two guys, uh, folks, and, you know, Mixon seems like a guy who's likely to leave after this year. So I don't know why they wouldn't maximize him this season. And Pirine looks like a guy that is better when he carries it more. So you've got two guys that you could use uh, more of, and yet they seem to be going the other way. It's a, it's a big question mark moving forward with OU. Just to remind everybody, you're watching Football Friday here from the Oklahoma newsroom. We're talking OU, OSU. OSU headed to Baylor for a 6.30 kick on Saturday, unless it lightnings, Kyle, which you brought up, and it's Sorry. now all on you. Bad voodoo. That's yeah. on me. Well, what a we, jinx. Jeez. Yeah, we, we did it last week. Surely not two weeks in a row, yeah. right? Well, I was there last time. The, the rain falls hard in Waco. That's <laughs> all I'll say about it's it. It's a hard rain in Waco. Well, let's talk for a second about the Baylor offense, because we talked all about 
the OSU offense for a minute uh, to start the show. But obviously, the Baylor offense, not led by Art Bryles anymore, but still very much an Art Bryles offense uh, to that style. What do you do if you're OSU, Kyle? What, what's, the, what's the key in your mind to managing this Baylor offense? Well, OSU has to utilize its depth. Um, you know, on the defensive line, they're set. They've got four guys who rotate in and out, you know, all at once at times. And, you know, they've proven with Cole Waltersheed, uh, Jarrell Owens. They have some pass rushers, a lot of depth inside. Uh, but I wonder about some of the linebacking core. You know, they're going to have to have these linebackers cover these very speedy Baylor receivers in the slot. You know, we saw some of that being exploited uh, in that Central Michigan game with how they were able to use the tight end. You know, can Chad Whitener hang uh, with the tight end with the speedy inside receiver? You know, Baylor is going to try to exploit those matchups. But the Cowboys have to rely on their depth. You know, they've, they've got a lot of cornerbacks, uh, you know, at this point that they trust who are newcomers and Lindsey Pipkins. Uh, Curry is another guy on the edge who's, who's been in the program for a while uh, and has come in, in important key times and games this year uh, in past years when he never would have. Those guys are going to really have to be relied on heavily late in this game. Uh, you know, and in their minds, I think they're hoping that the rain maybe cuts down on some of this Baylor throwing. Uh, but as Mike Gundy explained in his press conference, Baylor runs the ball to set up the yeah. pass a lot of times. Uh, you know, they, they have Shock Linwood uh, and guys who can make plays on the ground. Uh, so for OSU, it seems like this is the script they need to stick to. Utilize the depth, bend, don't break, and then get timely interceptions. We've seen it time and time again with this team uh, where they're able to make a big play late to seal a close victory. So mm -hmm. Baylor's going to get its points. You know, they've scored 40-some points a game in every game uh, to this point, albeit against a soft non-conference team. Uh, so it, it's hard to say exactly where they're at, uh, but I would expect uh, you know, to see us in the 40s or the 50s possibly by the end of this one. Well, we saw against Pitt, Cole, Wal Cole Waltersheed really stepped forward. Did I say it right? Walter Shied. Shied. Gosh, you're I not, screwed it up. I was sitting here, <laughs> sitting here thinking about it, and I still messed it up. He had a big breakout game, but we also saw, you mentioned the linebackers, Jordan Burton really played well. Chad Whitener played well as well from that linebacker position, but that was more in a run-stop role. But I thought Burton really had a, a game where he stepped to the floor. But Barry Kyle brings up a great point about the Baylor run game. And as much as they hurt you through the air, ga the games against OSU, the Baylor run game. I mean, I was at, in Waco a few years ago when they were still playing in the old stadium. And I don't even remember who it was, but a guy breaks through the OSU defense, gets so wide open, he pulls a hamstring on the way to the end zone and still scores like a 50 or 60 yard touchdown. That Baylor run game has been really problematic. What, what's key to really trying to slow that down, Barry? Well, Baylor's offense is very simplistic, but it's also brilliant. Think of it this way. Old time football was all played in the box. So it was in a very small, uh, small space. The spread comes along and the field got stretched wide. So now everybody's spread out. Well, Baylor added to that by stretching the field, spreading it, and building a big box. It puts two wide receivers on the very sidelines and often sends them deep. So you got to guard deep on both sides of the field, and now you're guarding a huge, a huge space. And then Baylor just wants to hand the ball and let guys run. That's all it wants to do. It's it's like eight man football. Mike Gundy said. You got to win one on one matchups. That's what playing Baylor's all about. You got to win those receiver against corner matchups. You got to win linebacker against a guard line uh, matchup. You got to tackle those Baylor tailbacks. Oftentimes, gang tackling doesn't help against Baylor because there's not a gang around. Mm -hmm. Everybody's spread out. When, when Burton or Whitener or uh, any of those, Jordan Stearns coming up from, uh, from the safety spot, when one of those guys gets a chance to tackle Shock Linwood, you got to do it. Yeah. When you get a chance to tackle one of those slot receivers on a slant, you can't let them run free. You got to tackle them. So Baylor just tries to get recruit great athletes and win one-on-one -on -one matchups. So that's up to the OSU uh, defense to uh, to win those matchups. If you win, Baylor doesn't have a lot of other options. Like I said, it's not a complicated offense. Yeah. So you tackle those guys, you win your matchups. And Baylor can be stymied. Is this a situation? I'm not. Uh, when I say this, I'm not imagining a you know 600-yard offensive day for the Baylor offense. But is it almost? This is strange to say, but if you're OSU, do you almost think we have to we have to keep the run yards less than the pass yards, or we got no chance here? I mean, do you almost have to look at it with that equation that it's almost to stop the run 
first yeah. issue with Baylor. Well, let your strength be your strength. I wouldn't be surprised at the end of this year if we're not talking about this OSU defensive line, like last year, as being a team strength. So, yeah. you know, have your best players do what they do best. You know, those cornerbacks are going to live and die on every play with the chances they take and, and going against these receivers. But I think you got something there in saying that if they can stop the run, it's going to go a long way to, to kind of doing what Barry said and, and kind of, you know, equalizing that uh, with the cornerback play. Yeah, think, back, think back to the oh, the 14 Oklahoma Baylor game. Mm -hmm. That's the game where the Bears came into Norman and beat them 48 14. The fans booed the OU defense because the Sooners wanted to stop the run. But they were scared to death of the long pass, and they played so deep that Baylor literally five straight plays just down that hike, five yard hitch pattern, ten Catch. yard gain. Yeah, exactly. Next play, five yard hitch pattern, ten yard gain. Yeah. They just bump, 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 <laughs> touchdown. It was literally the yeah. easiest thing you've ever seen. It sounds like my seen. golf game, Barry. You, it, well, I mean, <laughs> no. yeah, uh, they Hitches. threw the ball a lot straighter than you hit. <laughs> but and at some point, you got to bring those guys up and. You got to you got to stop the run. Yeah. You got to stop the run, but you got to dare them to beat you deep, and maybe they'll do it. And if but if they don't, you'll beat them. Yeah, great. It's going to be a huge chess match, obviously, which is one of the great parts of the the fun of all of this. Let's get back to OU for just a second before we do some quick predictions at the end. Brooke, a little preview of something you're working on for this weekend. A look at the Austin Kendall kerfuffle scandal. I don't know whatever word you want to say about it. But a week ago, the backup quarterback goes on Sooner Sports TV uh, for an interview, is asked about Ohio State, calls Ohio State's defense basic, uh, talks about Baker Mayfield's going to light them up. We find out that became not only bulletin board material, but cardboard cutout material. They had a sign on the field at the end of the game, did the Buckeyes. Now Bob Stoops saying he's shutting off some media access. Uh, what Kind of get us behind this. You've had a chance to do some reporting. Uh, what do you know at this point about the situation, and what what ultimately is Bob Stoops hoping to accomplish with all of this? You know, that's a great question um, because by Bob Stoops shutting us all out, I think it makes everybody much more curious as to what is going on uh, behind the scenes there. How did this happen? And so then we're asking more questions, and we're going to get to the bottom of it, um, regardless of if he wants us to or not. Um, but I've had a chance to talk with Austin's dad. Uh, his dad seems pretty unhappy that Austin that Austin's words went out over an OU program that is, you know, funded by the university, run by university people. Um, it was said at the end of like a three to five minute interview. The thing is, it's difficult to actually find this interview because it's been taken off the website. It was a part of uh, Sooner Sports Spotlight which is where they take a player and highlight something that they've done in the past, maybe somebody that wouldn't get a ton of attention, which explains why he was on there, because it wouldn't make sense, you know, if it was a preview for Ohio State, but it was a, here's a freshman quarterback, he, you know, just scored touchdowns last week, look at what he did, let's talk to him about it. So that makes sense, but now that's been taken off the website, they've acted like it's just gone straight from, you know, number three to number four, a race that he was the old Sooner Sports spotlight number four or whatever for um, last week. But all of it, his words came at the end of this interview. It was something that could have easily been edited out, and it wasn't. Um, and then it was broadcast on Fox Sports Oklahoma Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. It's when it always comes out, and then it re-airs a couple times throughout the week. And it got a whole, like, Ohio State fans saw it. And that's when it kind of all blew up Thursday morning. And it's just one of those things that I don't think, obviously, we will never be able to ask him about this for the rest of the year. Um, <laughs> or maybe ever. Who knows? Um, but I think it's something that really got blown out of proportion. He's an 18-year-old kid. He thinks he's in a safe environment talking to OU fans on an OU program. Um, doesn't really realize the magnitude of what he's saying and he's getting this from somewhere you know I don't I don't know who said it to him if it was a conversation that he had between you know him and Baker Mayfield if it's coming from Lincoln Riley if it's coming from Bob Stoops but I don't think that was the first time he heard it um, and just you know decided to make something up on the spot um, but I think there's definitely a lot of questions here why was this not edited out and now he's facing all this backlash on social media. Like I checked his mentions. It is a really scary place. Um, mm. Even, you know, yesterday, the first five things that were tweeted at him were thanks for the basic defense comment. Um, you know, he's getting ire from OU fans. He's getting 
stuff from Ohio State fans, apparently, and Ohio State defensive players so that they're going to use the basic defense thing as like a rallying cry the rest of the season. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that's going to go away anytime soon as much as he would like it to. Well, and uh, yeah, I mean, obviously a lot of backstory here and some that we may never know because as Brooke said, or we may not know for a while, Austin Kendall obviously not going to be talking to any media um, for a while. But Barry, it sounds like Bob Stoops is also saying, not only am I not going to let Austin Kendall talk, there's a bunch of other guys that I'm not ready to let talk either. What, what's the end goal here in your mind? I think Bob Stoops is just trying to get through the day. <laughs> I can't blame Bob Stoops. Um, you know, he, he sends his backup quarterback to what's got to be the most harmless place on earth, your own school's TV Sorry. show. And he, by the end of the day, he feels like Strother Martin on, uh, on Bush Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Remember coming down the, coming down the mountain on the donkey? And he uh, says, morons. I got morons on my team. <laughs> Bob Stoops is sitting here thinking, I got morons running my, my TV shows. So, uh. I mean, Stoops, Stoops might change his policy after the year. He's just trying to get through the week. And he can't even trust his, his own people to, to look out for a 19-year-old quarterback. Yeah. So, uh, I can't blame Stoops. Uh, we'll talk to him. We might can straighten this out. Point out to him that, hey, uh, maybe you send your players to us. We, yeah. It looks like we got a better chance of looking out for them than your own people. Yeah. But Stoops right. is just trying to beat TCU, so I can't, I can't blame Bob. Yeah, interesting stuff. Hey, guys, we only have a minute or so left on this Football Friday. Let's do some predictions. Brooke, let's start with you on that OSU-Baylor game. Who you got winning in Waco? Uh, I've got Baylor winning 30-21. to 21. All right. Kyle, what do you got? I noticed Brooke was the only one. I don't want to spoil this. No, no, she no. Was the not the only here. one. She, not she, the she, only it's one. already out, so you can just, you can was, you can spoil. That's why yesterday morning. That's right. That's it's true. The, no, she <laughs> so, gets to explain it tomorrow, but props to Brooke for uh, breaking the curve there. But I took OSU. Uh, I think that with Mason Rudolph and and sort of his progression to this point, it seems like a kind of the breakout game scenario for him. James Washington is so talented. I, I think that we're going to see more of this deep ball offense. Uh, and, and see this really carry the OSU team moving forward. Okay, Kyle spoiled it, but you picked OSU as well. I did pick OSU, the same reason I picked Pitt last week. <laughs> upset um, special? I needed a Big 12 upset special, <laughs> but here's the deal. Shameless. Uh, I actually think that Baylor is way overrated. Uh, lots of question marks about Baylor. I don't think Baylor misses Art Bryles' schemes, because they're still there. I think they miss his attitude. He had Swagger. A, he had an edge to him. Mm. He sort of instilled those guys with an arrogance and a fight. Clearly. It's not there. Now Grandpa is their coach, Jim Grobe. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think Baylor missed I think they, uh, Seth Russell coming back from a broken neck, still unsure. And I think Baylor's depth. You don't have to worry about depth when you're playing Rice and SMU. Right. When you're playing Oklahoma State and Texas and Oklahoma and TCU, you have to worry about it. I think Cowboys have a very good chance to win. Yeah, I'm picking OSU to win as well. And a lot of it is because we haven't seen – just, you know, Baylor being, you know, the 66-6 to winner that we've seen so often in the past in the non-conference. And, you know, at Big 12 Media Day, guys, we heard that they were already down to, I think it was about 70 scholarship players. Since then, there's been other inc incidents that have happened. So you just wonder, what do they have? What's the depth of talent? And how is that going to show when it's 80 snaps, 85 snaps? Could be really interesting to see Saturday. That's a 6.30 start on Saturday night. And be sure to stay with the best coverage team anywhere at newsok.com every day in the Oklahoman.